It's the inaugural record release from Disco Graffiti. Metal Machine Muzak is a slanted tribute to Lou Reed's divisive 1975 double LP Metal Machine Music. Lester Bangs called it the greatest album ever made, but no matter how it hits you, it's always been the ultimate music freak secret handshake. My Ambient Reimagining features four 16-minute, one-second tracks, just like the original, and each one was created by a top-shelf indie rock visionary. Lou Barlow from Dinosaur Jr. and Sebado, Corey Hansen from Wand, W. Cullen Hart from the Olivia Tremor Control, and Mark Robinson from Unrest. That's right, not a slouch in the bunch, unlike 99% of the compilations you've ever begrudgingly purchased for the one and only band on it you just had to hear. Metal Machine Muzak will not be available on streaming. The digital version is finally available for purchase, and the vinyl will be shipped this summer. Pre-orders for the LPs are available now, but they're going fast. They're being produced in a very limited edition run of 300 numbered 180 gram metallic silver double LP gatefold copies, only a hundred of which can be ordered online. These copies will be numbered from one to a hundred and they're first come first served. To order either the digital or the vinyl, just head over to patreon.com slash discography slash shop. Again, that's patreon.com slash discography slash shop. Don't miss out on Metal Machine Muzak, the ambient experience designed to make Brian Eno run screaming. This is my studio album in the studio album 1970s sort of way. And I wanted strings. I wanted all the instruments. I wanted tons of tracks and I wanted everything to be lush because I had access to a studio. I had just received that paycheck for that Wild World song. And I was like, let's go. I'm going to spend it. It was like a little kid in a candy shop. I kind of figured also, by the way, that that was just kind of how my life would go from that point forward. Just like every few years, I would get a big check for something I I did in like a couple hours time and it would just pay for my records moving forward and that was a one-time thing. Welcome to Discography, the music obsessives podcast that gives freaks like you and me the chance to connect with the Brotherhood Obsessed with rating the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever mattered. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and with four new episodes each week, you're going to gain a comprehensive knowledge of an act's history and output in the time it takes to listen to one album. Each new guest swings a hard left into an area you either had no idea you needed to know about or know all about and can't believe you're not alone out there. I support a wife and a five-year-old son with Discography as my sole source of income. So if you love the show and this episode, please Venmo me a tip at David-Gebro, that's G-E-B-R-O-E, or PayPal using my email address, which is David B. Gebro at gmail.com. I'm guessing you probably stuff a buck into a tip jar when you buy a muffin. Please then, gauge this podcast's worth side by side with simply being handed a muffin. My family and I thank you. And in this episode, we'll be turning our spray cans on Cassandra Jenkins, Psst. along with our special guest, Cassandra's mother's daughter, Cassandra Jenkins. Here's just some of the many things Cassandra and I touch on in this podcast. Her super cool, unusual childhood that portended an inevitable future career in music, the resourceful way in which she pulled the money together to fund the making of her first LP, Play Till You Win, and tons of details surrounding the ill-fated Purple Mountains tour in which Cassandra had been hired to participate. If you're a Cassandra Jenkins superfan like me, you'll want to turn this free version off right now and opt for the director's cut of this episode on our Patreon page, which features 25 additional minutes of essential material, including overviews of entire releases. And you can find it in our Patreon shop for mere pennies at patreon.com slash shop. 
or better yet, just subscribe for access to the complete versions of all our shows. I recommend the lieutenant tier at the very least, but the major tier is what you want if you want it all. Even if you're on the fence, just head over there because it's finally free to become a basic member. Okay, first things first, you need to know just how seriously I take this craziness. Discography is a music obsessive's dream come true. The guest and I explore an artist or band's entire discography in a futile but valiant attempt to reach a higher truth, which is often cleverly disguised as a nerdy compendium of star ratings and lists. The show is heavily researched and the music is always reassessed with fresh ears. We don't just cover albums, Uh uh-uh. We do a searingly honest deep dive analysis of all EPs, singles, comp tracks, relevant solo work, and sometimes bootlegs and live stuff. Every release is slapped with an objectively accurate star rating between zero and five, which allows us all. The real reason we do this, the Tootsie Pop reward at the center of the rock and roll lolly to come face to face with the true shape of an artist's overall arc. Coming up, we've got a career-spanning interview with the Beatles' Pete Best, Tom Morello rating the MC5, an interview with Thurston Moore, Robert Schneider from the Apples and Stereo rating the Strawberry Alarm Clock, and a massive, many-guested launch into the Beach Boys' entire catalog with... That's right, the Beach Boys themselves, in a series called The Beach Boys and Your Dreams Come True. So don't miss out. Open up your listening app right now and subscribe. And away we go then. I would love to just get a little tiny bit of coffee. Go for it. I'm so addicted. Where are you? I'm in Martha's Vineyard. Oh my God. Are you serious? It's so nice. This is my like. Oh my Christ. I was supposed to be there right now. No way. We could have been doing this in person. That would have been crazy. Where in the vineyard? In Chilmark, Edgartown? I'm in Edgartown, yeah. Okay. I, okay. Chilmark is beautiful. I, I, you know, it's a little bit of a, a, a drive from where I am now, but I've gone up there just a couple times. But yeah, what you see behind me is a painting. I'm staying in a, a little shack. It's a painting studio. My computer's propped up on some kind of hand drum. Hey, you've been, right? This is not your first time. This is maybe my fourth or fifth time, yeah, because I've just come out to visit and stay in this house, and usually I'm here on the off season, which I love. I love coming here during the winter. You feel how spooky it is. It feels like Salem, Massachusetts vibe. You know, it's just, it's so beautiful. It's my favorite place in the world, Martha's Vineyard. That's I'm, so cool. I'm so cool jealous. That I, I, <laughs> well, I hope I can just kind of like through the computer give you a little a little taste of it. I mean, you can hear like the bugs and... The birds. It's it's like yeah. very peaceful here right now. It, as long as you're not like in town, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. where I am, it's like just very peaceful. All right. Well, I just was infused with that vibe. Today's guest was put in my life to remind me of the magic in the everyday. She sees universes in the microscopic, and in turn makes us feel reassuringly infinitesimal in the face of it all. In the course of a relatively short career, during which she's played in Eleanor Friedberger and Craig Finn's touring bands, almost played with Purple Mountains, and released only an EP, three LPs, and some singles, she's experienced a growth curve scarily comparable to an artist who's been slogging it out on the circuit for decades. It's this fast-forward cue approach to skill curation that's got me coming back for more, because climbing inside her world brings one disparate rewards, many of which are ineffable, intangible, and indescribable. By day, she's one of the most inimitable and skilled songwriters alive, but come nightfall, out in the back alleys of Discograffitiville, she's picking your pockets, but then filling them right back up with what you really needed all along, because she's the quotidian magician, the compulsive chronicler of synchronicity, she's (laughs) Cassandra Jenkins! (laughs) Amazing. Wow. Uh, wow. What an, that, that intro deserves an award. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Well, I mean, you are definitively a seeker. I don't have to ask you that. So definitely like minds there. For anyone who's listening right now, who, shame on you if you don't know, is not familiar with your work. <laughs> what I'm going to do is paraphrase a paragraph on your website and replace the name of your newest record with your name. So 
Like the night sky itself, Cassandra Jenkins is always expanding. As time marches forward, she cracks open the promise of reaching the edge of the new with a wider sonic palette than ever before, encompassing guitar-driven indie rock, new age, sophistapop, and jazz. But it wasn't always the case, and I would be interested in your work no matter what, but what to me makes it so interesting and the focus of this show is really the 30,000 feet bird's eye arc of a career Mm -hmm. is that if we rewind to the beginning, it was a much simpler time. And to me, I would label you, if, if I had to label you to someone that I was describing your music to, as a very talented genre adherent, blessed with a singular lyrical perspective, but a mm-hmm. genre adherent. Because, well, we'll get, to, we'll get to why. Let's go back all the way to the beginning, talk about your family, because that's mm-hmm. a very important aspect of who you are. Your parents, yeah. musical family, they played on cruise ships in casinos and hotel bars. Tell me how you either were fed influence by them or pushed back from the influence from them to become who you are. I think it was both at various points in my life. You know, as a child, I looked up to my parents so much and I was surrounded by music, whether or not it was my dad practicing piano or like, you know, he would often accompany singers in sort of like cabaret style performances and I would hear them in my living room. I remember hearing the jazz standard All of Me for the first time and being absolutely terrified because I hadn't yet developed metaphor. I was taking everything literally and if you look at the lyrics of that song, it's like a horror film. <laughs> it's like <laughs> this uh, <laughs> dismemberment, <laughs> this slow dismemberment. And I just remember being like, what is this? And hiding inside of my little couch fort that I had built for myself. So I was really exposed to a lot of music from a very young age. Did your home double as a music venue? Is it an actual honest to God it is music now. venue? Okay. It has been for about 20 I think 23 years now, which is more recent history. My parents moved in to the apartment where they live now about 40, I want to say 44 years ago. and Which is where you currently live still, right? Yeah, it's where I currently live. And so I've lived there my whole life on and off. I also moved around to various apartments and cities when I was in college and stuff, but it currently doubles as a music venue. So our living room is very mobile. You can see the way in which it very quickly transforms into a music venue and we pull out all the chairs and there's a little stage that we can fold into a a small piece and unfold when it comes time to put on a show and during the summer we don't do it because it's just way too hot we don't have the infrastructure to air condition a brownstone apartment or kind of like central air or anything like that it's just impossible to get that many people in a room without it feeling just really unpleasant what's the capacity i mean we cram everybody in and it's probably like 60 people but we've definitely had over 80 And those were some of the more packed, like, you know, 20 people outside of the capacity in a small space can feel like a lot in New York City. But yeah, people sort of generally stay for the whole show. That's more than fairly unusual as far as a way to grow up and beyond cool. So did your music career or your notion to actually have this as a path? through which to live your life? Did it begin when one day you were just like, you know what, F it, and you just went up and sang in front of people in your house? So I was maybe like 19 when those concerts started. So I had already been performing for a little while and played and I had a sort of garage band, even though nobody had a garage in New York, but our equivalent of a garage band in high school with a bunch of my friends. And I had already been playing with my family for many years. In terms of going off on my own and performing, I think I really had to calibrate my sense of what performing was. And that didn't happen until much, much later. When I started to realize that when I really loved what I was performing, but I've always been pretty shy and I've always been sort of averse to being in the spotlight. So you can imagine that that would be a sort of contradictory existence of being asked to be on stage and perform all the time when I really naturally would much rather not be in the center of attention in the spotlight 
And I still think that that's true, but I realized the difference for me was when I have a reason for doing what I'm doing and it's very clear to me, I will kind of do anything. My performances have ranged so much. There's so much that no one will ever see because there were no cameras there. And I think it's only because I unlocked something, I think, when I got a little bit older and realized like I started doing sort of more performance art stuff in college and If I have a sort of raison d'etre, I'm going to do anything. But when I was a young kid, sort of a little bit being prodded in this role that I didn't fully create for myself or understand, I was more uncomfortable with being on stage. I didn't necessarily relate to the songs. Um, I didn't dislike it. I just knew that I didn't feel totally genuine in doing it. Because you were self-conscious when you were in front of people? Yeah, I definitely had anxiety. I had stage fright. But I think stage fright starts to dissolve when your mindset shifts. I was just a really sensitive kid. And being in front of people was like a lot of information to take in. I was always a pretty sensitive kid. I was on the spacier side and... Being on stage, I think, was a lot of stimulus for a little person like myself. And I am sort of the exception in my family, at least. My sister and my brother loved being on stage. They loved leading the band. My sister loved dancing as a kid, and my brother was a violinist, loved soloing, as some violinists do. And I think when I got a little bit older and I discovered deadpan, I think I started to understand myself in the context of my family and understand that I had a slightly different sense of humor, a slightly different way of engaging with an audience or being on stage. And it was a little bit less jazz hands than maybe the rest of my family. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Even still, it still continues to be true, I, I think. And I love the way that my family performs. And I think when someone loves to be in the spotlight, and they thrive in that spotlight, it's a really incredible thing to behold. And I've just always recognized that I'm going to function sort of differently in that space. And to sort of go back to your initial question, I didn't start to think of myself as a performer or as a career musician. I mean, only more recently am I thinking of myself as a career musician, only because I've just started doing it, stopped doing it, like kind of done it as much as I could within reason. I'm actually curious about the transition because I know you graduated from RISD in 2006, and then for two years you worked as an editorial assistant at The New Yorker. So how did it come to pass? What were the decisions involved with you deciding, okay, I'm ready to lay down my first batch of songs, which led to EP in 2013? Mm -hmm. What was that transition? That was done in a very moonlit way. Got the job at The New Yorker, worked there for a, a couple of years. The whole time that I was working there, I was also playing in bands at night. And I think part of the reason that they hired me was they saw that I was not so solely focused on this publishing job that I wouldn't be so myopic. The songs that wound up on the EP, were they being performed in a band setting? And then you just decided to pluck them out and do solo versions? Yeah, I guess I recorded that EP in 2012. So there was a four year period of me playing in a million bands and At the time when I recorded that EP, I was working part-time as a nursery school teacher and art teacher. So I I was working at a Catholic school teaching in the mornings, and then I would go to the studio in the afternoons and record. So again, like just like squeezing it in when I could. So far, I see your career in two phases. I kind of subjectively slice an artist's career up, and this is just my own brain. So we have entered phase one, diehard genre loyalist, 2013 to 2020. Now you may refute that, but I see this narrative where you inhabit like a country folk tradition and then sort of punch through to another side where it's all being frappéed like crazy. Yeah, I think that's true. I was playing a lot of old time, a lot of bluegrass, and I realized one day, I remember one day I woke up and I was like, this isn't right, this feels inauthentic to me. And then I started to discover more indie music and like dated a DJ from East Village Radio who introduced me to all this great music and like 
then I started to kind of break through into a space that felt like, oh, there's a lot for me to discover here. The songs on EP, how do they strike you listening back today if you go back and listen to them? I thought about listening to them before you and I spoke, but I decided to just, you know, it's funny. I, first of all, really appreciate how much you've prepared for our discussion today and I was you thinking, have no like, idea oh. you have absolutely no idea <laughs> I'm listening I, to your stuff day and night day and night researching like crazy I really appreciate that and it's it, it it's very felt I was feeling like a hack today being like oh well I didn't prepare and I'm like wait you you spent years of your life like making this music <laughs> you're you're you so you prepared <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah <laughs> exactly I was like okay I think I think it's okay <laughs> well first of all I I know the last time I did listen to those songs I, I could hear how youthful my voice was and that was a real shock to me I was like oh my voice has aged I like didn't feel that happening and of course that does happen and those songs there's a little bit of a blue-eyed soul quality to a little bit of that EP I think I had just started getting into the art of recording because of the friends that I was hanging out with they were just sort of teaching me things and telling me what they were getting excited about and it was just this very youthful sort of green curious space and I was going into it with very little preconceived notions for what I wanted to make as a statement I just wanted to make the stuff that I was excited about and I I remember there's that song Telephone Ghost which I really love still I, I think one thing that I love about going through my back catalog is you can see these seeds for what I'm doing now in a much more aware conscious thoughtful way but I was just it was just shooting in the dark when I I was younger and there's that beauty to that which you'll never be able to get to again because life keeps lifing and you keep living it i mean it's yeah clear, it's clear your process has changed wildly to the point where i would probably guess that you didn't have a process back then and now no. it seems like you have a thick really really studied process that i would imagine at least for your most recent record involves multiple mood boarding and like most of the process i'm guessing is collecting inspiration and then slicing up how it gets delineated and what percentage is fed into the sausage grinder of the influence machine so that it comes out in a certain way it's very considered not in a labored way but you could sense a symphony of influences where here it's very attenuated but in a way yeah. that also makes sense it's not i mean there's nothing that you've ever done that i don't like if i had to choose a least favorite song of yours in the history of your recording it would be wild world and that's not even your song <laughs> yeah and you know what i did that for money and it paid for my entire first lp oh that's cool yeah. that's cool that's good to know that i didn't do that for fun i did it because i got paid to do it and I have no shame in saying that. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. In fact, it, it's cheesy as fuck. We can it's, I don't. E I don't even think so. I think it's a good remake of it because you literalize the lyrics instead of it yeah. being an upbeat song about downbeat stuff. You make it face itself in the mirror. Yeah. So th yeah, nothing that, wrong with that. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, and you know, I, it's funny that recording taught me a lot. It taught me that really cheesy things can sometimes reach the most people because that song was the first time that I think a lot of people heard my voice partly because it was on a TV show and that's how I got paid but it really resonated with people and I thought huh okay that's interesting I never would have done this except my friend called me and asked me to do it and it did teach me a little bit about being okay with dancing on that what feels like a dangerous line of what feels sort of cringy or cheesy or whatever word you want to choose and fill in the blank there. I, I think it's really important to let yourself play with that line if it feels right to you. Look, if that's your version of quote unquote selling out, first of all, there's no way to sell out anymore. I mean, when, when Neil yeah. Young was recording this notes for you and it was like really uncool to sell or give your song to commercials, you yeah. know, now how are you supposed to make money as an artist? You have to take up every opportunity imaginable. I've been 
thinking about that word sell out because I grew up, I was a kid like growing up in the nineties and sell out was like such a big insult, I think in the nineties, especially. And you heard it applied to a lot of bands. I think for sure earlier than that, like, as you mentioned, was, was very true, but it just doesn't apply anymore. No one would blame you. I mean, in fact, like, you know, I saw a clip of Ice Spice having advertisements before her show came on broadcast on the stage for false lashes and people had commented on it. Okay, well, that's how she's paying for the tour. And I'm like, yeah, that's how she's paying for the tour. That's why she's not canceling it because she's not going to go into debt doing this tour you know yeah, I, yeah. I don't know what her financial situation is I think she's doing quite well for herself and actually very proudly so and I think that's more our attitude towards making money these days for popular artists it just doesn't apply anymore and there's also really artistically satisfying ironic ways to sell out where you know I, I believe Bob Dylan sold the times they are a change into a bank and that's wow. brilliant that is absolutely brilliant and it's a comment yeah. he gets to comment artistically in a way yeah. that actually builds on the life of the song so yeah. I actually like every single song on EP. I'm cool. hearing a lot of Cowboy Junkies in there. I don't know if that's an influence. I didn't know their music. So again, it's one of those things where people heard my music and told me about that band. They told me about Low, what else, and Twin Peaks. But when I made it, I, I wasn't aware of that band at all. But I think probably my friend Charlie, who recorded me, was. But yeah, I love that band. And it makes sense that coming from a sort of awareness of folk and country music and also an awareness of like grunge 90s bands and punk bands that I was going to see like it was helping me sort of make sense of all of the various things that I loved when it didn't necessarily make sense to me at the time. Did you feel recording this like you knew and were comfortable with an identity or your identity as a singer and songwriter? I think I've always had a very clear sense for what I liked and didn't like and I've, that's been always my guiding light and it's always been very thorough. Like I, I had this, I remember this black suede jacket with fringe on it and if I could sum up that period of my life, it was just that jacket. I remember I lost it at a show, never saw it again, and probably that's around the same time that I started changing and mm -hmm. finding new things <laughs> to get excited about. But that jacket was very much my identity in, at, at that moment in time, and, and it was peak indie sleaze era, and so that was everywhere around me, and that was also bleeding into what I my understanding of what it was to be playing music at that time. My favorite song on it is Motorcycle Mary. And yeah. there's also an aspect of that one. I wouldn't say it's directly informed by this, but there's a spare, elegant, dreamy, Angelo Badalamenti sort of take on Spectre-esque yeah. doom pop that, yes. ha that touches the entirety of the EP. Uh, and the song that feels to me more connected to stuff where we're looking around the corner at where you'd one day be would be The Bird. Yeah, that was maybe the first song that I wrote on my own. I wrote that in college, actually. Years later, I recorded it because it was my first recording. So I had these things that had been kicking around for a very long time and it was just their chance to get on there. But I can speak to a couple things like this is, again, my very, very early songwriting. So a lot of those lyrics are pulled from or all of those lyrics from The Bird are pulled from a Jenny Holzer piece that I had seen at a show at, I believe it would have been the Whitney when it was uptown at the time. And that was my response to that body of work. It was very haunting. It's very dark where that material came from. And it resonated with me. And that was my response. And Motorcycle Mary as well, I was working with my friend Keegan Goodman, who I co-wrote that song with, he wrote the bulk of it. And then I came in and sort of like brought it to life and helped to solidify the arrangements and the structure and just how it would all form. And that was the case with a lot of the songs in this band that I was in at the time when I was working at The New Yorker. We were playing bars at night, like the, the Lakeside Lounge was one of them that's no longer. It was in the East Village. A lot of these dive bars that just don't exist anymore, we were playing. And you were playing these songs at the time? Motorcycle Mary was, I think, the only one. But yeah, that EP became a funnel for 
a lot of different things, like the song I wrote in college, the song I played in the band, uh, we were called The Last Days. And I was really obsessed with Fleetwood Mac at that point in my life, too, uh, which may not show on the record, but that was also like the pinnacle of recorded music for me at that point in time. I'm guessing you and, mean the, the Buckingham Knicks era. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's <laughs> um, funny because if I was going to discern any era that would have been influential on you, it would probably be the Bob Welch era. Interesting. Cool. Because there's a haunting, very reverbed out kind of feeling yes. to this. So okay. um, here, I'll give you my review. Okay. So simply because it's kind of disarmingly just called EP, and then mm-hmm. it actually is just that. It's kind of like a novella before your great American novels. And, <laughs> that it, and that it came out four long years before the first album proper. I came at this one thinking, in all likelihood, it would be a baby steps intro to your biggish works. But honestly, I was punched in the stomach by how powerful it is. Calling it that, calling it EP, is kind of a beautiful bait and switch because the material is as impassioned and gorgeous as the title is plain and stripped down to the studs. The whole piece feels like a lonely whale way, way out in the desert where no one can hear you make your beautiful noise. And although you definitely hadn't worked through or risen above your influences yet, your contribution to the canon is moving enough for none of that to even matter at this point. I would give this three and seven eighths stars. Okay, cool. That's so beautiful. I I think there's something really insightful about what you just read in that it really was making sound with no intention of anyone hearing it. And it was very desert conscious, sort of the dream of the desert, not actually the desert, because I was living in my childhood bedroom while I was making it and sort of dreaming about those desert scapes and definitely thinking no one would hear it. Did you have certain expectations about people hearing it or not hearing it? No. And what, was there any disappointment afterwards that it didn't you know, have more of a resounding thud or no? No, I was shocked because one of those songs was reviewed in Pitchfork and NPR. I was totally shocked. I'd never read Pitchfork. I wasn't aware of the things that I'm aware of now. And so it was actually quite the opposite. I like couldn't believe that anyone was listening. And I was making it for my friends. I loved playing shows with my friends. It was like my friend Charlie pitched this idea to record it with me. I never would have thought about recording myself. It, it seemed pretty foreign. I had made attempts at recording before, but it was all very kind of like live and scratchy. So yeah, no, I I was not disappointed or even knew what that would look like. What do you give it? I, I, I saw you flinch. I really don't, I really have a hard time with rating systems. And I know that that's the point of this, but it's never like made sense to me. So I'm trying to impose this system on my own brain. It's completely stupid and utterly insane. And it's a lost leader to talking about much more important things. And no one rates their own stuff. No one sits around thinking, I wonder how many stars I give my own record. Yeah. And even the reigning rating bodies out there have decided that it's okay to change their rating later when they decide it needs to change. So that to me is a very powerful and hilarious statement that sort of puts even current ratings, it kind of turns them on their head. But I just have this funny relationship to my older songs where I, I want to just congratulate my young self on doing something sort of fearlessly. You can give it without, five stars. I don't know if I would. Like, Can you give something with only that many songs? Yeah, absolutely you can. I mean, there's EPs that are much better than albums out there. And to be able to utilize pithiness in conveying a message must be applauded. That's very cool. I'm going to actually just like look at the track listing while while we chat. I know that we probably don't want to spend too much time. on. I want to spend the entire episode on this one. (laughs) (laughs) By the way, are the performers on this? Are they from the last days? You have some really sympathetic players, especially I got to shout out. I'm going to guess that it's Charlie who did that really great bluesy keyboard solo in Up in Flames. That's actually my friend Michael. So this was a band called Ice Water, and they backed me up when I was playing, but they had their own band. And they then also came and backed up Eleanor Friedberger when I played with her and went on to play with her for years, actually. 
And this was the Ice Water band backing me up on this whole thing. 2017, Played Till You Win. What yes. a record. It, it, se- it seems like you definitely were taking in a lot of George Harrison solo works. <laughs> 100%. Okay, so yeah. talk to me about the influences here. The diminished chord. Let's just give it up for the diminished chord. <laughs> George Harrison also employed that in a lot of his solo music. Yeah, I think I was really obsessed with a lot of alternative country from the 1970s, which was such a golden era of the recording industry and recording studios, because it's right before things went digital. So people have really mastered the art of analog technology technology and it's just at its finest and most expensive and labels are throwing tons of money at it and I just became obsessed with that era of recorded music because there's nothing quite like it and I think that was also a moment when I became more comfortable with the recording studio because I was becoming more obsessed with methods of recording and recording to tape and how I wanted to record. You mixed it on a 40 year old piece of analog equipment. Yeah exactly with Eli Cruz at figure eight and thank you for bringing that up I mean something I really love is I love liner notes and I love liner notes that get into specific details like that because when I love a record like I love to learn things about it and how people made it and it connects me with other things that were also mixed on that machine and it's a way for engineers to kind of sink their teeth into something and so yeah I think this is my studio album and in the in the studio album 1970s sort of way and I wanted strings I wanted all the instruments. I wanted tons of tracks and I wanted everything to be lush because I had access to a studio. I had just received that paycheck for that Wild World song and I was like, let's go. I'm going to spend it. It was like a little kid in a candy shop. And yeah, that was, I kind of figured also, by the way, that that was just kind of how my life would go from that point forward. Just like every few years, I would get a big check for something I did in like a couple hours time and it would just pay for my records moving forward. And that was a one-time thing. So yeah, I became just really interested in making records. And When I made my EP and those other singles, I think I was so new to it and really just less aware of what I was doing. I think on this record, it was like my degree in watching really talented engineers do what they do best and then calling in all my friends, a lot of whom are on my most recent record. So we can revisit that later on in our discussion but again new york it was recorded in 2015 oh wow what accounts for the wait for the release i mean i think we're used to artists pulling things together really quickly but remember that i'm self-funded and self-releasing i did all of this completely on my own i didn't know what distribution was i didn't know how to contact a vinyl plant or get jackets pressed or know how to put stuff up on Spotify and let alone like work jobs during all of this. So 2015, imagine like I'm surrounded by a lot of my friends' bands, Katie Von Schleicher, Big Thief, uh, Landlady, um, my friends, the relatives, like we're all playing at the Manhattan Inn all the time, which is a venue that was in Greenpoint. And I just called all my friends and we would play together. I would try these songs out live before recording them. And just it was just a very vibrant period. It was very much about the recording process. And I think as a result, like the songwriting was kind of secondary to the recording process. Which is wild to me because every single song on this record is very strong. And the one that I want to start talking about is track two, because the greatest Mm. thing about the song Tendency Waltz is that you think it's going to be a cover of a standard, but instead it's an original that's so good that it immediately hits you like it's a standard all on its own, which cool. is a, it's, it's a ballsy thing to do. It's like writing a novel and calling it The Grapes of Wrath. And that's then so funny. it turns out it's as good as Grapes of Wrath. There's definitely not a bad song on the record. And they all really sound like this is the work of somebody who's been at it for a long time. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, so to hear that, that was of secondary consideration, probably because the learning curve in the studio that you had to kind of master in order to be able to produce what was coming around the corner was intense. But when I hear this record, I hear, you know, I, I mean, I'm just like a, you know, armchair A&R guy, but I'm, you know, I'm hearing hit after hit after hit. That's amazing. Thank you. And it's funny, Tennessee Waltz is the original song. I've tried, and 
please correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a song about a song called the Tennessee Waltz, but I don't think that the song that it's about even exists. So I, I liked the idea of writing a song about a song about a song. Um, right, right. I just like love that kind of layered meaning and, and I'm getting a kick out of it or I was when I was writing it in a way that like I didn't know if anyone else would. And also it was my way of acknowledging my history with folk music, with standards, with bluegrass and this song that I heard a lot in bluegrass and say like, I appreciate this part of my upbringing, but it's not all that this is. And I'm going to kind of like add no, it's definitely not to it. And so that was my moment, I think, when I did sort of start to acknowledge myself as having my own voice in a way. Um, yeah, it's like taking ownership over your influences. Yeah, exactly. Right. What were some of the key George Harrison works that really made you definitively want to slather this thing with the slide? All Things Must Pass probably the big one there's that one i can't remember it has the word apple in it apple scruffs yeah i love that song i think for whatever reason that song really also got me hooked or like there were just certain things that were like gateway drugs for me and that was one of them and then just the whole all things must pass album that's as far as i'm concerned the best beatles solo record yeah there's so much wisdom in it candy crane's a classic Are, are you a big arcade game player I was as a kid. I think I just, there's a certain relic about those arcade malls. I was very entrenched in a sort of nostalgia. If you think about some of the bands I was listening to at this time, like I loved the band Beach House. I still do. But like Mm -hmm. at the time, I think I was really obsessed with that band and their ability to encapsulate this feeling of nostalgia, of childhood, of like, how do they do that? And so I was in my own way obsessed with my 80s upstate New York life and the beanbag chairs, the stuffed animals that I had won at the county fair, the spookiness of all of that, of just like an old teddy bear staring back at you from the corner of the room. I think I just (laughs) wanted to sort of capture that feeling of just like 80s plastic toys and plush toys and the tiny little rabbit ear TV we had. VHS tapes, I was really obsessed with VHS. Again, like I was obsessed with things in a really thorough way. Like my wardrobe reflected it. I collected and converted so many VHS tapes at that time, including all of our home videos. I wanted everything to feel kind of like VHS-y, even though it's a slightly different era than a lot of the recordings I was referencing. That was just sort of the aesthetic for me. It's a great song. Lyrically, you had me right from the go. And then uh, track three, Jan Lee Jensen, because we talked about Tennessee Waltz. Jan Lee Jensen, I think that there's a version of reality where you stayed in this songwriting lane, comfortable, hand-in-glove country genre feel, and your material yeah. remained amazing, but just skewed in a much different way. Do you ever think of who that Cassandra would be if you decided not to do the found sound explorations and <laughs> you know become more expansive in your reach? That's That's really funny. Yeah, she would be playing like folk at bluegrass festivals. Yeah, that's funny. I think I just always have to twist things. Like I can't stand when things are straight ahead and predictable. And like, I think I always have to subvert whatever I'm doing in some way, Mm -hmm. even if it's just not to be a punk, not to like show off, but just for myself, like I just have to like find the thing that I can twist about something. And I think Jan Lee Jansen's one of those songs where that's another one that I used to sing with The Last Days with Keegan Goodman and just like a really brilliant example of songwriting from that band where it's a country song, but it's very cerebral. It's about death. It's about what happens to our bodies after we pass away it's certainly morbid but it's also quite beautiful it's asking big questions in a way that i think graham parsons the flying burrito brothers like i became more interested in that kind of music cosmic country it's not just country Mm -hmm. it's it's folks who are putting it on its head a little bit i love that it's one of my favorites guess what my favorite on the record is though i haven't gotten to know your taste quite well enough yet but let me think i'm beaming it to you right now okay i'm trying to remove interference yeah yeah it's funny i want to say red lips but i'm getting hotel lullaby it's disappearing disappearing wow didn't see that one but you know it's funny it's right between those two songs so i wonder if i I should have split the difference (laughs) maybe i maybe we are psychic (laughs) i think think that's what we can take away from that 
That's so funny. <laughs> um, Shame is another great song. Love the strings and the sad, sackiest slide guitar figures stuffed in that one. I love depressing music and you do it so well. And Thank the you. final chorus really could be my favorite lyric on the entire record. Isn't it a shame when you come to know the difference between someone who can change and someone who says they will, but still stays stuck in their ways. And, right. and not easy to sing, too. Yeah, it's pretty wordy when you think about it. That song also was another like chord discovery. It was the minor 7 flat 5 that you hear throughout the song. I learned that chord probably from a George Harrison song. I don't remember, but I was just like, that chord. I need that chord. That chord's going be everywhere. <laughs> Your songwriting influence over time feels like it receded from the Beatles, but here it feels very strongly indebted yeah. to the Beatles, and I'm hearing Beatle chords definitely in shame. Yeah. Was that a conscious backburnering? I think I was very willing to embrace that influence on this record, and I think it was partly an echo chamber with me and my partner at the time, Sam. I think we were both just like getting really into that stuff and getting into the methodology behind their recording and getting into a lot of also the John Lennon solo records, living on the Upper West Side, thinking about him and Yoko, like walking the same paths that I did and in Central Park. So I think I was just really in it at that moment in time. And then there was a, a session on this most recent record where it started to go in like a Eggman walrus outro and I was like absolutely not stop right there don't even think about it <laughs> I did that we are done with that <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. No, everybody get right, out. Right. It almost feels like a reaction to that, where in Red Lips, all of a sudden, it's like Euro Trash adjacent with mm -hmm. some of the doom laden synth hits that are going yeah. on. Yeah. But that's unlike anything in your discography, Red Lips. What I hear on it is a little bit of the blue eyed soul thing from the lyrical structure. It's very simple. It's very much like a love song that almost has like the chord changes of that blue eyed soul era, like doo-wop girl era in a way, now that I'm thinking about it. But that was when I, you know, people heard my last record, my EP, and they said, have you ever heard of Twin Peaks? And I was like, no. And then I went and watched the entire Twin Peaks and was like, oh, okay, now that I'm aware of it, I'm going to write with that in mind. And I felt like you hear that Battle of Menti mm. thing of that bum 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 right there. It's just yeah, yeah. not hiding it. What people responded to from my last record, I'm taking it and now with some awareness, bringing it into the music. It also features the DX7, which I don't know if Battle of Menti used the DX7 or not. In any case, I had a DX7 in the basement and I revived it and I was very excited to use it. Talk to me about the lyrical position on disappearing because the line, I disappeared for three days without prior notice. I disappeared for three days. My whereabouts were unknown to anyone. My guess mm -hmm. is that this is not you inhabiting a character. My guess is just by the way you sing it, that you've done this. This is you. Well, it is me and I'm also adopting another voice. I think what you're hearing is when something resonates with me, it's usually because I have some kind of personal experience with it. I am one of those people that when I'm in a mood or in a zone, like I will kind of disappear. And my friends sort of know this about me, some of whom aren't my friend anymore because they get so annoyed with it and tired of it. But like <laughs> some of them who are just understanding and be like, okay, welcome back. Where were you? Like, what's going on? And what you just read is actually a Chris Burden. Again, like super into performance artists, but there was a Chris Burden piece where that was written on the wall and I just loved it. My whereabouts were unknown. Just like that as a turn of phrase was something mm -hmm. that I needed to internalize. I love everything about this song. I love the lyrics. I love the rise and fall of the melody. You know, every time you cycle through it, it's really affecting, just powerful and simple because your work can be complex. So when you do simple, and I'll get to this also on the new record. You have some simple songs on there that are surrounded by some massively complex concepts and ideas. And so those simple works become so much simpler, so much more direct of an emotional hit because yeah. of the texture that surrounds cool. it. Hotel Lullaby, I love. I actually have to say that your reworking of it in 2019, I prefer. Mm. I think you actually improved cool. on it. That's um, cool. That's great. Which one do you like better? Do you have a preference? I don't know. I should listen to them back to back. I think 
I just became interested in remixing something as an acoustic version, and I, I, I was really proud of that song. It was one of those lightning songs that just came out really quickly. I just love that line. I reference it again in my new record, and again, like, vaguely pulled from a poem that I read once about, like, no one's home at a hotel. And it's like, oh, yeah, no one's home at a hotel. They're all vagrant. They're moving on from place to place. Like, no, no one's home here. But there's this sort of emptiness to it that I found really funny. And so I just liked inhabiting that song. And I think I just wanted to keep doing it long after the record had come out. Oh, hi. I'm Dave Gebro. I threw my career as a licensed hearing instrument specialist in the trash, sold my house, and moved to the East Coast with my wife and five-year-old son in order to focus on making the ultimate weekly podcast for music obsessives thrive. But weekly wasn't enough for me, so I bumped it up to four shows a week. Becoming a subscriber to Discograffiti's Patreon gives you access to hundreds of exclusive episodes. As a two-show-per-week private, you get the weekly show by and for our Patreon family, the Discograffiti Soldiers of Sound podcast. As a a three-show-a-week lieutenant, you'll get early release, ad-free, extended director's cuts of the main show. They're the shows as they were intended to be heard. Plus, you'll gain access to half the Patreon archive and the upcoming Beach Boys Behind the Mirror companion episodes, which will feature dozens of special guests from within the Beach Boys camp talking about and rating their music. But as a four-show-per-week major, you'll be drowning in a flood of must-hear binge listening, because I'll be bombarding you with episodes about super cool bands that are too subterranean for free Fridays. It's like going to music college, but with a tuition that makes all kinds of sense. Plus, our entire Patreon archive is yours. Discograffiti's Top 10, our Buried Treasure show, Rock Cousteau, our Slag Off show, Queasy Listening, and the Private Press with Paul Major. And all that for the price of only a cup of coffee a week. Times are tough, you say? Fret not, because there's a dollar tier. Or you could just join as a basic member and buy episodes piecemeal from our Patreon shop. Don't risk feeling badly about yourself by not giving. Check out patreon.com slash discograffiti to find the tier that's right for you. Once again, that's patreon.com slash discograffiti. What I really love about Disco Death Dance is that it's this fully straightforward love song with what sounds like to me like a Lay Lady Lay inspired Mm -hmm. lick at its center with Mm -hmm. this title that completely flies in the face. I don't know if the idea was, it almost reminds me of This Is Spinal Tap when he plays this beautiful (laughs) piano thing and it's called Lick My Love Pump. (laughs) (laughs) Because this title could not feel any farther away from the direct emotional impact of the song. But this is one of my favorite songs as well. That's really funny. My favorite turn of phrase from that movie these days, the word mud flaps to describe someone's butt. I was just like, mud flaps. (laughs) baby she's got him like i just that for whatever reason like that line hit me the hardest on the most recent watch so disco death dance is the title of a short film by the visual artist marcel zama and you know he has a whole kind of visual world as a music lover you might recognize some of his work from some of beck's album covers i think he rarely will do commercial work. So I know a lot of his work from gallery shows, but I love this one film that was projected on many TV screens at the David Zwerner Gallery in New York and Chelsea. And it's of these figures that show up in his work over and over again, sort of in this sort of cult-like dance to this it's a, it's a, it's a beat that sounds almost like a Casio keyboard or something. And that's what I wrote the song to was that beat, basically. And I just liked this sort of cult-like devotion to another person that's almost like you just don't question it. It's almost to, it's to a degree that is sort of questionable. Are you talking about love in general? Just the concept of two people deciding to engage in mutual hypnosis? Yeah, or yeah, I think that's a good word to describe it. Just the sort of like love sickness that happens or essentially codependency that can happen in friendship, that can happen in friendship, that can happen in romantic relationships, that can happen in like a cult environment. I think I just wanted to sort of 
analyze that a little bit. And this, the lyrics get a little bit darker as the song goes on. Like it starts out sounding like a love song and then it, it's like very much two people are mirroring each other and experiencing the same pain and the same like skin, the same like everything. <laughs> And you're kind of like, oh, wait, maybe that's not such a good thing. (laughs) I'm dying to talk to you about some time because conceptually Mm -hmm. we could spend the entire podcast talking about, you know, I lived in L.A. for some time and there were people who came out there who would just say, I'm going to give it six months. And if it doesn't happen, I'm going back to Nebraska or I'm going back. So. I'm curious if you gave yourself ultimatums early on, like if you didn't achieve certain goals by certain cutoff times, then you had to give up pursuing music as a career, or were you just dead set on going for it no matter what the consequences were, if it turned out to be like super rough going? For me, the idea behind that lyric is don't put so much pressure on yourself. But there was a sort of go for gold feeling about this record, which is called Play Till You Win. So there is this sort of awareness of a career trajectory, potentially. I, of course, was looking at it sort of ironically, and I did pull it from a candy crane machine. But yeah, I thought of it as sort of a hopeful message of just like, don't worry about what anyone else is doing. You're on your own path. And that quote is actually, this is now kind of embarrassing, but I think I was just really moved by it at the time. But there's a really beautiful video of Jimi Hendrix's grandmother, who was the first person to give him a guitar, who was maybe one of his biggest champions in his life as an early person, from what I've read. She said that to him when he was a child. But did she also say, none of them like you, dear? Give yourself some time, because that... This is one of the things that I realized, like, doesn't translate in song in the way that I wanted it to, which is a learning experience thing from songwriting like sometimes things sound differently than you mean them to and it's like none of them are like you nobody's like you you're you're one of a kind is actually what it's saying the fact that it is interpretable is fine with me but it's really saying you are one of a kind don't worry about what anyone else is doing and if you see it in the context of this one interview with her it makes a lot more sense but of course you're getting this song completely out of context that's not your fault as a songwriter no no i I think that's how it comes off in the song i really believe that i i really i looked back on it like a couple years later i was like oh i was so stuck in the way that i heard it that i didn't hear how it could be, be interpreted there's so many people who this could be their theme song because having that pep talk is important you know a song like this could wind up having tremendous import to people that you never meet in your life yeah potentially that's true i think that's how i felt when i saw that interview and you look back on like yeah Jimi hendrix revolutionized live music recorded music as the guitar guitar music as we know it one of the most influential musicians of the last century <laughs> but as a kid didn't even own a guitar someone had to hand him that guitar and say like things might be weird out there don't worry about it just like follow your own path are you hard on yourself because three albums in almost nobody this much i can definitely say with total confidence and not just because you're sitting in front of me but like i said before you know the real foundation of this show you know because this is how i listened to music before there was a discography all i did was make a show out of it i'll listen to an artist's entire work to get a sense of what the growth was like and Mm -hmm. almost nobody three albums in is as far into a wild growth curve as you. So are you hard on yourself about, I thought I'd be farther along, or are you like, wow, I've really, and I don't think it makes you an egotist to concede to that. Are you impressed by where you are? I think the record that we're talking about now, which was in 2017, marked a point in time for me where I had been exposed to the kind of success that my friends were experiencing at the time. And I thought, If I work hard enough, that same success will be granted to me in a matter of time. And when it wasn't, I think I was disappointed because I put every cent 
every dime that I'd earned, every ounce of myself into that record with the expectation that someone would say like, hey, we want to put this out on our label and like, hey, we want to take you on tour. And hey, here's another $20,000 for this song that we're going to put in our TV show. That didn't happen. None of that happened. And I was disappointed, especially because, you know, I was comparing myself to my peers, which is a huge mistake that anyone can make. And it's in that song, again, that's like the grandmother saying, like, there's going to be cool people, there's going to be scenes, there's going to be executives, there's going to be all these people talking to you and making you feel all kinds of ways. But like, none of them are like you, like follow your own gift. And at the time, I didn't even want to admit how disappointed I was to have made something that was like a classically like sleeper of a a record in terms of career momentum. So I pretty much at that point had decided, okay, well, I did that and it didn't work. So I'm going to go on and keep doing other stuff. It set the stage beautifully for what was to come, not just the work, but the changes that would happen in your life in 2019, which we'll get to momentarily. It sets the stage for yeah. all that. We're not even done with it. We have Haley to talk about, but we also have several songs named Haley to talk about. And I know it wasn't your intention to sort of wrap up all your records for the rest of time immemorial with a song called Haley. But um, (laughs) right, this was going to be a a one time deal, right? To do a song called Haley. Yeah, at the time. So that one is written by my friend Ian Davis, who plays on that record and plays on my most recent record. And he wrote that song for me to sing. It's about Haley's Comet. I was already at that point, had already met my friend Haley Gates, who will come up later, already was just like totally infatuated with her, just thought this is like the most incredible person. I remember sending her the recording of Haley as the one that we're talking about right now, knowing that it wasn't about her, but just being like, here's like a love song to a comet, and I want you to hear it. (laughs) It's great. And the hook of the song is the penultimate note that you hit at the end of each chorus line, the minor key that slides up. To the yeah, major. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I love I, every time you repeat it, my heart twists in half. Aww. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. So here's my review, my written review of your record. Okay. They always say you have to master your craft before you go and start coloring outside the lines. Notwithstanding, mm. just saying fuck it and doing whatever the hell you want right at the go, it seemed to me that you were consciously making an attempt at that craft mastering path in the 2010s so that by the next time you popped out an LP, you weren't necessarily totally unrecognizable, but you really had to lean in to hear the same lady. Your approach is so deft by now. So this, to me, marks the moment where you master the craft of songwriting within the structures of genre before you go ahead and shred the rule book. I'm going to give this four and three quarter stars, but I believe honestly that I'm being a little hard on it by giving it that. (laughs) It's just rating by a curve because I feel like where you're about to go is so momentous that just in relation to it, I'll give it four and three quarters. I absolutely amazing. love this record. Thank you. It's amazing. That's so cool. The listeners out there, if all you know are the two most recent ones, go back and check out where Cassandra came from because it puts everything in a kind of context that you don't get just by listening to some of the more outre, non-genre structured work that you've done. Yeah. That's so cool. I I think that that's very true and not something I could have seen when I was making it. But it was very much my version of going to engineering school. And I think as a musician out on my own path, it's really up to me to decide what I want to learn and how I want to learn. And things like record advances are basically, I see them as essentially like tuition for the school that I'm creating around me. Right. And I've very much learned about the recording environment on this record and became really comfortable with it. I I think something I, I, I recognized going into that record and coming out of it was like, I've noticed when someone is not comfortable in a studio environment, they do a lot of things to try to make everyone feel really comfortable and like kind of ceremonialize the process. And like, I wanted to get everyone together and like do 20 minutes of yoga. And I had all these snacks laid out and like all this stuff. And I realized like, wow, it's actually the mark of like a very green thing. And now 
when we go into the studio, there's none of that. Like we're just getting down to business and like all just having the best time because that's the place where we want to be. I'm not worried about the pomp and circumstance of anything and like blessing the studio in just the right way so that we get just the right take. I'm like, take all the magic out of it. We're just, we're here. The magic will come when it needs to. And like, you can't force it with a bunch of granola bars. Like, (laughs) (laughs) um, so I, I think I really learned that on that record. I graduated from from like the uh, snack obsessive sage burning self to the person who <laughs> felt comfortable enough in a studio environment that I didn't need all those things. Yeah, you can tell by the music, although I can't discern any discomfort in this record. Do you think, you know, they say that we all feel like frauds deep down. Do you feel like Bob Dylan, for example, right now at this stage in his career, do you feel like he comes out and he he's like deep inside he feels like mm. a fraud i'm wondering if it really affects everybody i don't know but i know that you know a lot of his earlier career he was singing other people's songs and like mm. really adopting the music of other people so i think a lot of his early career was very much embracing his borrowing of other people's material and styles and his entire career is built on that so maybe he does not that he is a fraud i obviously revere him as a songwriter and as a performer as a person and thinker in the world but i think it's really silly to think that any of us is like purely original you can't grow up in a vacuum that's why i feel like i could never have a guru because after all they're just human just like me and that's what makes it difficult to even have a therapist i think because how is a human going to solve a human's problems that doesn't make any sense to me it gives that person a lot of authority for sure and i do have that issue as well and i think A friend of mine who's a child of two therapists very much feels that way. What's coming up here in your life now is a pretty heady period, I think it's fair to say. So at this point, 2017, 2018, and into 2019, you're still working at the flower shop that you sing about in Delphinium mm-hmm. Blue, right? Mm-hmm. So you quit when you were asked to join David Berman on the Purple Mountains tour. That's when you quit that job, right? Yeah, I actually used that word by accident around my old boss. And I was like, I didn't quit. I just left. <laughs> I got asked to do that tour. And I said... Yeah, sayonara, I gotta go. How did that gig come about? How did you get involved? And did he ask you personally to join them? No, he did not because we did not know each other. He entrusted the musical director to do that. And the musical director was Jarvis Tavernier. I don't know if you've ever spoken with him, but he's a friend of mine and someone who I just love so much and really look up to in a lot of ways, even though we're basically the same age, by way of a few conversations with Katie Von Schleicher. And Katie knew that I was around and playing in bands and is also someone who Katie writes and records her own music, also is an engineer, also plays in other people's bands. I think she and I have a lot in common in that way and that like we like playing a lot of roles and, and we don't see ourselves as just one thing. So I think she saw me as another good person and and I think the person who needed to fill that role in terms of the skill set required of them really could have been just anybody because the guitar parts from a lot of David's songs are very simple and, and the idea was I would be shadowing him on the acoustic guitar on nights where he wasn't feeling well or just for songs where he just needed a little bit of a boost. And it became very clear throughout the course of a few rehearsals that, in fact, I would just be playing the acoustic guitar and he would not be playing guitar. But I just had to learn a lot of material in a very short period of time. But the the songs themselves are very simple in terms of acoustic guitar parts. But I think it had a lot more to do with my personality and, and just having the right bedside manner and the right kind of experience of like being in various sort of touring scenarios and someone who maybe wouldn't be super intimidated by the task, even though I definitely was. I think I just knew how to handle that at that point in my life. Like, you know, I was kind of like, why are you asking me? You could ask anyone. There's so many incredible guitar players out there. But then when I got there, I kind of realized like, oh, this interpersonal dynamic is important and I sort of have a sense for why I'm here. You know, it's one of those things where I think a lot of things in life that seem like the be-all, end-all goal, by the time you get there, it feels right instead of feeling like insane um but i just felt so at home in their company and it just i just felt at home so it just 
it just made sense uh, and, until, of course, it, it really didn't. So you never played? Yeah. We never played a show. Right. How many rehearsals total would you say you had? I think we had four. Yeah, I think we had four rehearsals. If not, we had four days booked and maybe maybe we didn't make it to the fourth, but the number four is the, the number that I remember. Looking back, I mean, I have to imagine you were scouring those three or four times looking for anything that you overlooked or just signs of anything. Did you pick up on anything where you felt like this may not be pulled off or? No, no. No? You know, I knew that he was struggling for sure and he was dealing with some things at that moment in time. He was late to the first rehearsal because he had been, I think, traveling all night because his car had broken down along the way. Like, things were hard, but no, in fact, all signs pointed to him being very excited to be on tour. So, no, I, I was very mystified, aside from the fact that I know that he has referenced oblivion in the songs and referenced suicide and, and sort of the other side of life in his music. You know, he was high-fiving the imaginary audience in the rehearsal space. Right. Like, it was very real, this idea of us being on tour. So, no, I would say it was easier to find signs to say we're really doing this than it was to find signs... Yeah towards what actually happened. All right, that about does it. If you enjoyed this episode, then please Venmo Gebro. I repeat, Venmo Gebro at David hyphen Gebro, that's G-E-B-R-O-E, or PayPal at my email address, which is David B Gebro at gmail.com. Please keep in mind, this is entirely how I support my wife and five-year-old son, so don't risk feeling badly about yourself by not giving. Stay tuned, because next week we've got part two of Cassandra Jenkins, who goes for broke after experiencing boatloads of trauma and produces her two best albums to date, an overview on Phenomenal Nature and My Light, My Destroyer. Okay, here's the week up ahead. This Sunday, our weekly show within a show, the Discography Soldiers of Sound podcast, drops for our Patreon's private tier. These are real people with talent and a burning fire deep inside, just like you and I. Then come Monday, it's an off-the-beaten-path discography episode for our major tier. After working as a session musician for Motown and a member of Detroit Spike Drivers, Ted Lucas released what many consider to be the greatest private press folk album of all time. Come Monday, you'll get the lowdown on his career. And then on Wednesday, the Lieutenant Tier get their early release, ad-free, super-extended director's cut of Cassandra Jenkins Part 2. And then come Friday, the rest of you penny pinchers get to join in on the action. A heartfelt discography thanks goes out to my beautiful wife and son, Jen and Mason, the latter of whom just started kindergarten today. Cassandra Jenkins... Dead Oceans, Pamela Nashell, Rudy Fishman, Becky Boyd, Jay Schultz, my incredibly loyal fans, and especially the entire Patreon community, the Soldiers of Sound. I love every last one of you, and this show would not exist without you, my friends. Speaking of friends, it's high time for some new ones. They're in our Facebook group, Discography Soldiers of Sound. That's the best way to find out what's coming up on the show, but there's a hell of a lot more. You get recaps of the day in music history, the ability to pitch questions to guests, polls that put you in the driver's seat on guest and band decisions, access to a thriving creative hub if you're looking for a collaborator, and much, much more. So make sure you don't miss out. You can find the link to the Discography Soldiers of Sound Facebook page right there in the show notes. And if you don't mess with the Zuck, no sweat. Just email me at info at discograffiti.com and I'll keep you in the loop. So now that it's done and you want more, another way to dive even deeper into the wonderful world of indie pop is to leap headfirst into my interview with Kula Shaker about the albums that shaped them. That's episode 139, the four-part Mark Robinson series. That's 128, 130, 135, and 136. The three-part Will Cullen Hart Olivia Tremor Control series, that's 131, 132, and 133. Vashti Bunyan rating her entire catalog, that's 103 to 104. 
an interview with Foxygen's Jonathan Rado. That's episode 75. Rado rates Rundgren. That's 37 through 40. Unquestionably the greatest Lou Barlow interview of all time. That's episode 62. Lou rates the zombies. That's 59 and 60. Anthony Fantano rates the Velvet Underground. That's 32 and 33. Jen Pelly rates the Raincoats. That's episode 15. And the Cocteau Twins, episode 3. And of course, be sure to mark your calendars, because next Friday, September 27th, we're coming at you with Cassandra Jenkins, part two. Trust me, you're not going to want to miss it. And so, from now till then, don't let our youth go to waste, lads and ladies. It's Discography. Discography.